speech and um, so on. But uh, I will try and stick to the title while speaking a little bit about the opposition forces, the classes in Iran, and at the end maybe a little bit about the left and the working class, if I get the time to do all of this. <laughs> Of course, things have changed dramatically since uh, the Bush administration's uh, regime change policy time. Uh, in some ways, though, they haven't changed that much from the days of PNAC, if you remember, and uh, the council in Washington that used to meet regularly to discuss <coughs> regime change in Iran uh, with a number of uh, ex-princes and royal family members and secular Republicans and so on under the auspices of um, the, the White House for regime change. Uh, but some of the quotes that have been coming out of the US administration in the last few weeks as, the, as we entered the new uh, levels of sanctions that are uh, imposed against Iran, it would be hard to say that much has changed. In some ways, very little has changed. Um, and some of it we don't hear because maybe we don't watch Fox News, or, uh, or I don't, anyway. Uh, there's a very good quote from someone who is an advisor to uh, Obama called James. Uh, his surname is James. He's spoken to Fox TV, and he says, uh, we know there are internal uh, problems within the Iranian government. They are very serious problems. We are hoping that uh, these short, short, sharp sanctions will uh, precipitate regime change. The combination of this together with um, uh, the fact that there is problem inside the country can facilitate regime change. Um, there are other uh, comments by people like McCain who as late as July were uh, uh, arguing um, for regime change and uh, asking Obama why he's not more involved in this task. Um, in some ways, uh, this week's gaffe by Ra Cameron that Iran already has the nuclear bomb um, shows the level of arguments that are going on behind the scene. The argument is uh, that leads to people like uh, the Navy commander in the US saying there are military plans also for attack if the, sh the, uh, the sanctions don't do their job. So in some ways, we haven't moved on that much. And in, it is ironic, because uh, Iran isn't an anti-imperialist government. It's not exactly doing much in the region. Its uh, economic and political problems uh, do not make it a threat to the United States' uh, um, practical day-to-day -day policy in the region. Yet it remains a rogue state, and yet it remains a state that has to be disciplined. It's quite clear that uh, as a superpower, the US cannot tolerate uh, the, uh, this government or any remnants or any connections with this government to remain in power. Uh, otherwise, there is no, ex no clear explanation of why there is such an obsession about Iran. Clearly, there is the, the issue of the, the Persian Gulf and the passage of uh, oil in the region, the strategic location of Iran, there are certainly elements of the fact that the US has never forgiven um, the loss of uh, its main ally in the region in the form of the Shah. There's clearly uh, the uh, future of Israel and the future military strategy of the US in the region that call for uh, disciplining Iran. Uh, and the sanctions can only be explained within those, uh, the, this concept of regime change can only be uh, uh, understood if you, if you look at the situation like that. Uh, unfortunately, it leads to uh, a misunderstanding of what Iran is or what it represents in terms of Palestine, in terms of opposition to US policy, that is often exaggerated and uh, gives it an an aura of being uh, anti-imperialist or anti-West, which is a better definition of where it stands. Now, um, the sanctions that have been imposed, as uh, we have written for Hopi and in, in uh, Hopi's documentation, there's a lot of information about it, are very serious. Uh, it, on the superficial side, it's not just the uh, 
Iranian ships that have changed name and company four or five times in the last two years in order to avoid sanctions. These companies keep uh, staying in the same place with the same offices, but their labels change. Um, nowadays, the Iranian planes have to change names as well. I noticed one the other day in London Airport where the emblem is the same. <laughs> they haven't wiped out the Hachamaneshi bird that um, is the emblem of the airline, but the, the name of the airline is Free Bird or something now, as opposed to the Islamic Republic's national airline. Uh, but in terms of people inside Iran, these are very serious sanctions. The uh, financial sector uh, affects everyone's life. Um, the fact that banks can't uh, exchange money, can, can't send, almost all of Iran's banks now are within this list, mainly because the state also used them for military and nuclear uh, exchanges. Uh, but also more directly is the, the job losses that are uh, of concern to those of us who are looking at uh, where the working class is and how it's fighting its battles. So. I will not go into the details of the sanctions, but it is true to say that that level of sanctions, in the, even in the short term, can create negative results in causing despair amongst the working class, in creating uh, um, the levels of poverty and un unemployment that damage political struggles, that damage uh, uh, both the opposition in general but more importantly, worker struggles, worker strikes, and so on. Um, and in that way, that the policy of regime change uh, sought by the US is of a, of serious danger, a serious danger to the future of the movement in Iran. Um, if we look at uh, the way the US is envisaging this regime change, um, there are both the comical scenarios and also the more realistic ones. And apparently one of the realistic ones being considered is uh, regime change by natural causes. In other words, the death of Ayatollah Khamenei, the supreme leader. And the US is already looking at senior Ayatollahs. They've actually got apparently a group studying people in Guam who can become this. Uh, but um, there are other options being considered, most of which uh, concentrate on the fact that two levels of struggle within the regime, both between the hardliners and the reformists, but also more, in more importantly and increasingly now uh, quite strongly, the, the battles between the conservatives themselves in terms of the president and the uh, what is called the conservative faction of the parliament, the majority faction of the Iranian parliament, uh, will, create, um, uh, will create more, more discontent and will allow protests to grow. That's the scenario they are looking at, that within those formats of the state fighting each other, there will be uh, demonstrations because there will be fuel shortage as is very likely in autumn of this year, there will be protests because of job losses, and that would allow um, intervention or levels of foreign intervention. Um, at the moment, there is very little to see on the ground of any direct financial support for a particular force. However, it is quite clear that uh, reminiscences of Iran regime change and uh, a television channel called Velvet Revolution, believe it or not, um, do uh, prop up every now and then categories of people who are seen by the US administration as possible uh, candidates for the future government. Now, these include both the uh, uh, so-called intellectuals, former allies of the Islamic Republic who are currently in the US, uh, Kadivar Ganji being amongst the most prominent of those. Uh, these are secular people who were, uh, uh, sorry, religious people but not clerics who were around Khomeini himself and later around quite a lot of the circles of the Islamic Republic but have now discovered Popper, believe it or not. And they are in the US and they're being uh, presented as a respectable, uh, moderate uh, opposition that understands Islam. It's uh, 
very good for the region, apparently. Uh, two combinations of royalists and republicans, or um, maybe alliances of all of the above in a format that takes um, a government of national unity. I assume that's the Karzai model that takes secular people and religious people and former warlords and puts them all into one large basket. Uh, contrary to what uh, some people in Europe and in the US have said, and contrary to what, for example, uh, Petras has written, Musabi and Karubi are not part of the US regime change policy. They might become one. There might be a time when the US might settle for these two as candidates of regime change from above. But at the moment, the fact that they remain loyal to the Islamic Republic um, and the fact that uh, in some ways they, uh, they remain very loyal to the first decade of this regime, the Khomeini period, um, makes them unlikely candidates for the US to see them as, as regime change people. It also is detrimental to them because inevitably they want to remain in, the, in Iran. The fact that they actually, in my opinion, believe in the co current constitution of the regime, the fact that they believe they're not just pretending, they believe in maintaining the status quo means that they will not uh, be sufficient to appease the, uh, the Israeli agenda in the Middle East, but also it would not even be good enough uh, to argue that uh, the US has taken back Iran because there would be too many connections with the previous era. However, if uh, nothing else happens, maybe they will become the alternative. Uh, I'm not ruling it out. Uh, In fact, the, 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 the whole reformist movement has this contradictory nature, or the green movement as it's known outside Iran, in that uh, their survival depends on the fact that they are being tolerated. And we have to accept that they are being tolerated by the Islamic regime. I mean, this is a government that um, has um, killed thousands of its opponents, so it would have no worry about um, arresting leaders of the green movement. They are being tolerated because they remain part of the system and because they represent quite large chunks of the backbone of the Islamic Republic. Quite a lot of the uh, parties that were the former uh, initial uh, organizations that set up the republic are part of the, reform the current green movement. So it would be very difficult to um, if you like, not tolerate, <laughs> it, it would be more, de uh, more dangerous. However, there remains the contradictory nature of their position in that this association with the previous, with the current order uh, makes it more difficult for many sections of the population that have far stronger uh, and more radical opposition to the regime to associate themselves with the green movement including feminists, including the workers' movement, including the students, including anyone who is campaigning for genuine separation of state and religion, whatever, uh, from whatever political background. And in many ways, um, that is why the definitions that have been used in the West in terms of uh, Musavi Karubi representing if you like, the Velvet Revolution, as Petras says, or as some of the US uh, part, political parties of the left have been claiming, is completely wrong. If one looks at the formation of the forces that were present in the large protests of last year and have remained on the opposition, have not moved back to support the government, it's not simply that numerically they were far too large to represent a certain class in Iran, but also I think people who classify them as middle class have very little understanding of the changes in the Islamic Republic, of the, uh, uh, of the 30 years that has changed in t uh, the, the characters of the country in terms of industrialization, in terms of urbanization, in terms of... Uh, uh, modernity arriving in a country. And this has been, despite the Islamic Republic, but it has happened. 
because that is how the world moves. You can't keep back an industrial country in the Dark Ages. You might be able to keep parts of Sangin province in Afghanistan isolated from um, urbanization, modernity, um, industrialization. But you can't do a, a, the same with a country with 70 million where the movement of the population is mainly from the countryside to the cities because of the impoverishment of the countryside to a country where up to 70% of the population is uh, urbanized now and where 75% of the population is under the age of 25. It's very hard to maintain uh, that level of, if you like, uh, rural uh, association with um, uh, some of the more fundamentalist and some of the more um, mad ideas that current leaders of the Islamic Republic are associated with. Um, and therefore, the opposition does cover classes such as the um, working class that is educated, is urbanized, um, that is industrialized. It, it might be facing large levels of unemployment, but it remains still as a class with a history that goes back to at least 1905 as uh, comrades see from the books on the, on the table there. Uh, but also it includes it, uh, teachers, nurses, government employees, clerks, students. And in, in that level, it's partly the misunderstanding of definition of who is working class, not just in Iran, but anywhere else that has created this confusion of uh, classifying, for example, nurses or teachers as middle class. And as I mentioned earlier, it also, the, the, the entire uh, reformist or green movement, when it started, it gathered support not just from people who opposed the Islamic Republic in its totality, i.e. people who were uh, fed up with the intervention of state, uh, religion and the state in their private lives, uh, and uh, the economic, disastrous economic situations of the mid-2000s. Uh, but also, uh, it includes large sections, large chunks of uh, the Islamic Republic. Um, some of the parties that I mentioned before, including Mosharakat and Alab al Islami, these were the founding uh, organizations of the Islamic regime, and they are now with Musavi and Karubi. So, this, if you like, even within the Islamic movement, this is quite a, a, a major division uh, between. Uh, those who don't believe the 12th Shia Imam will land on a plane in, a, uh, uh, in one of the uh, major motorways that uh, Ahmadinejad is building for him and actually see this as an insult to the intelligence of their nation. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and those who, uh, uh, for various reasons, might, might want a, a uh, the continuation of modernity in a different way. And of course, amongst them, it also includes the working class that has suffered considerably from uh, 30 years of um, um, uh, not only political crisis, but economic crisis. In fact, the upper classes and the capital earning classes in Iran have very little um, of, contra of, of confrontation with the Islamic regime. It might be true that sections of the aristocracy might use a drinking session to drink to the death of this or that supreme ayatollah. I'm not denying that. But in terms of the way they have lived and the way they have operated in the last 30 years, first of all, very few of, uh, with the exception of those that whose finances and whose capital was directly involved with the royal court of the Shah. Um, many of them were not that badly affected by the Islamic revolution. They might have lost their property in the immediate aftermath of the revolution, but the Islamic regime was the first to return most of these factories, land, um, businesses back to their original owners if they were not part of the Shah's court. The, you have to remember that the Shah's dynasty was a very short <coughs> period of uh, two father and son were the only people. For most of the Iranian aristocracy who comes from this huge Qajar dynasty, 
they were the nouveau riche. They never considered them um, m much of a royalty, and therefore they have very little loyalty to that level, to, to the Shah's court. They adopted very easily and very well to the Islamic regime. And in the last 30 years, they have managed to increase their fortune considerably with very little hindrance after the end of the Iran-Iraq war. So 20 years of uh, um, where a dictatorship has helped extensive exploitation of the, of the workforce. And at the same time, um, there have been minor inconveniences like uh, the increased bureaucracy or the intervention of state in their um, gatherings and their private lives. But the Iranian upper classes have managed very well to coexist with the Islamic Republic through paying bribes, as is well known by those people. And so it is wrong to think that necessarily the capital earning classes or the, the people who are inside Iran, I'm not talking of the exiles, but the people who are inside Iran are not, were not looking for regime change last year. They are not looking for it now. They would tolerate a smooth regime change within the Islamic regime, from Ahmadinejad to Mousavi, as it will make their private lives easier. But they will not be in favor of any upheaval that will damage their, their finances, their capital. Um, in some ways, then, the, the opposition is uh, the poor, is the people who've been, um, uh, 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 who, who used to even um, get sacked from permanent jobs as the Islamic Republic brought contracts more and more into the workplace um, and became temporary workers, casual workers, construction <coughs> workers, and now can't even get that as a result not just of the economic crisis that is worldwide, but also the increasing bite of the sanctions, as the US wants to put it. Um, many people have argued that the, current, the continuation of the current situation means that the opposition will die down. But because of the, um, if you like, the fact that neither of the two regime changes I mentioned before the US one or the inside the Islamic Republic one are in the interests of the masses and the people who demonstrate, the people who are on strike, the people who go on demonstrations, then one could argue that the continuation of the current situation, i.e. the fact that the state tolerates this semi-legal opposition of Musavi Karubi is good for the working class and for revolutionary forces. Uh, in that uh, they have time to organize, they have time to plan, they have time to, to discuss some of the issues that uh, hadn't been discussed in terms of the demands of the working class, where the working class is going, uh, to organize itself as a class for itself, um, and so on. And it is precisely because of that that this sharpening of sanctions is trying to precipitate the situation out of the control of ordinary people. In a way, it's an intervention, whether it is by the US or by, uh, within the, from within the Islamic regime, it will be uh, 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 imposing radical change quickly, but without the intervention of the masses. The continuation of the current process would have been better, especially if the leaders of the Green Movement uh, were going to take up some of the slogans they keep saying and they don't do anything about it. Uh, there have been on a number of occasions, as you know, where they have called for protests, they have called for um, opposition, and then uh, they have done the grand old Duke of York thing in that they back down at the last minute, uh, allowing a fizzling out of the um, emotions and the political movement that was gathering momentum before that protest. Having said all that, I think we, as far as we are concerned, we have to consider um, where that leaves the left and the green movement. I think before uh, in another talk for Hopi, I did talk about uh, the um, um, effects uh, or the, the current struggles of the working class and why the working class doesn't see itself uh, part of the green movement, although as individuals it participates in the demonstration. But for example, it is uh, resistant to organizing a strike, a political strike at this stage, in its dissociation uh, 
the, from the leaders of, from the Green Movement. Uh, I think we also have to look at the left and the Green Movement. And here, it's important to uh, argue that uh, unlike outside Iran, I think whatever one thinks of the many splits of the Iranian left, I personally don't know uh, of any of the political groupings of the Iranian left that support Ahmadinejad. There are individuals. There are individuals in exile, there are individuals in Iran. But you can't say this political group or this political line is supporting the current uh, government or the supreme leader. I might be proven wrong, but uh, I don't know of any. Um, the attitudes of the Iranian left varies from the liberal uh, left, I, I'm not sure if anyone calls them left, which is uh, support for Karubi Musavi in a total almost uh, adoring way. And uh, some, of the, uh, some of the positions taken by Musavi in recent times reflect that, uh, not only uh, the fact that now every time he, t he speaks, he talks about the workers. He's found out that there is a working class and you need it if you are <laughs> part of a movement. But also, uh, uh, I'm sure um, some of you have followed that uh, Musavi and Karubi uh, were visiting uh, Mrs. Osanlu uh, almost daily in early July. I hope this is not the reason why he's been put back into some trial. But uh, anyway, it, it was a, 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 if you like, the, the Green Movement leaders have discovered that there are workers who are in prison in Iran, and now they're not they're paying attention to it. Um, However, that doesn't solve the, 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 the main issue in that economically their policies are the continuation of the neoliberal uh, policies of Ahmadinejad. In fact, the initiator of many of uh, the so-called um, reconstruction IMF style policies in Iran was Hatami, who is part of the reform movement. So one can't uh, really have um, much uh, hope on that. The, uh, the Achilles heel of the alliance between this uh, so-called liberal left and the Islamic um, green movement is the question of the massacre of um, 1367, which maps out to 1988, more or less. And in that... Uh, uh, massacre, thousands of political prisoners of the left were executed by the Islamic regime. Musavi now claims that uh, although he was prime minister, he did not see the correspondence on this issue. Uh, not sure who had corresponded to him, but he hasn't seen it. But in a way, the fact that he's not even managing to uh, condemn those executions so many years later is the Achilles heel of that. It, will, it can break, if you like, this alliance. Having said that, I, I have to emphasize that this liberal left, I really don't want to use the word term left about it, um, is like many other uh, places in the world, actually the remnants of the most hardline pro-Soviet forces in our country the forces that supported the Soviet Union. The two, this so-called liberal left is the uh, Tudor party majority and uh, Fedain majority and Tudor party. And here lies also one of the problems of the Iranian left. Uh, uh, in the shadow of the Soviet Union from 1905 to 1989 when it collapsed, the Iranian left's definition, its own definition and its own existence has always been in relation to the Soviet Union. And no wonder that once that has disappeared, most of these people have moved so far to the right. They have lost the compass that was the socialist camp. Um, but the rest of the Iranian left has also defined itself uh, very much as part of, as, uh, in terms of what was its policy to the Soviet Union. Uh, in 1979, and even now, there are four, some would say five, but I think four major uh, political lines in Iran, and most of the definitions of these lines are uh, taken from their origins in terms of the, the Soviet Union. There is the Tudian majority, which is called Line 1. It actually is recognized as Line 1. 
Then there is the guerrilla groups, uh, and they're not guerrillas anymore. Uh, there is no more military uh, armed struggle, except by, I think, a group of half a dozen people who lived somewhere in Europe. Uh, uh, they defend the idea, they're not okay. involved in it, just in case anyone wants to arrest them. Um, but uh, their policies go back to the 22nd Congress of the Soviet Party. They're the people who, if you like, say everything was fine until the 22nd Congress, or their origins goes to that. Of course, there are evolutions of these ideas since the 1970s and the 1980s. Then there is, that's line two. Line three are the Maoists, and they are quite considerable, partly because one of the biggest splits in the Iranian Communist Party happened in uh, early 50s, and the Maoists are quite a strong remain, despite many splits, the fact that they went, some went pro-Albanian, some remained pro-China, most of them are now not pro-China, and they obviously can't be pro-Albania, but <laughs> they remain Maoist in their ideology, on the whole. Um, and the line four was Rahe Kargar, which is now split, and the Trotskyist movement. And the Trotskyist movement has, hasn't moved Far. It has actually almost disappeared. Um, I think one person who was an ally of uh, Torov was the last flag holder of uh, the Force International in Iran, and the, in the subsequent arguments about Venezuela, uh, they, were, they kept writing letters to Venezuela saying, don't support the Islamic Republic, and eventually the, their faction of the Force International threw them out as opposed to <laughs> arguing for anything else. So that's more or less died down. As a result of all this, I think the Iranian left isn't um, in a very strong position, despite the fact that it's numerous. Ideologically, it's not strong. Politically, it's not strong. And this doesn't mean that it hasn't had political parties. It doesn't mean that it hasn't, there haven't been many attempts at forming united parties. Um, we could argue some of the um, issues involved in the, in, the session, in the question and answer session. But uh, it, it remains numerically very strong, and it remains numerically influential amongst the working class. It just is not in a position to go beyond some of the arguments that has, uh, bought, has have been prominent in its debate since 1979 and maybe before. One issue that isn't, however, relevant to the radical left in Iran and one that one should argue against is this concept brought time and time again by the bourgeois opposition and by uh, today and majority in that uh, they see a dividing line in the Iranian left between those who are for violence and those who are against violence. Right? And in many ways, I don't know of any left that is for violence. The accusations that sections of the Iranian left are, uh, if you like, um, pro-armed struggle is totally uh, uh, irrelevant. That, hasn't, that argument hasn't presented itself since 1978, I would say, where even in the Fedayeen, which was one of the biggest guerrilla organizations, the, the uh, arguments against continuing armed struggle, this was pre-Islamic Republic, were prominent. And people were becoming aware that uh, really it wasn't just armed struggle had separated them from the working class. They were isolated as a political force. They could not intervene in the struggles that were happening against the Shah. Uh, they were marginalized originally, at least, as the workers' councils were being formed in various factories and so on. And so the argument about armed struggle is a figment of the imagination of the leaders of the Federal majority and to the party. On the issue of uh, demonstrations, yes, there is a different attitude towards the tactic of participating in demonstrations. And clearly, uh, those who want to support the status quo, those who don't want uh, change of any significant kind, those who want regime change within the Islamic Republic are always calling for silent protests or silent demonstrations. And I would say these would fall into the category of Musavi Karubi's political line. And 
those sections of the opposition who call for uh, more radical forms of protest, who call for civil disobedience, people who say we should um, take over factories that or stage, stage sittings in factories that are being closed and so on, are considered uh, defenders of violence, which is um, quite a, a misuse of this definition and is diverting the arguments within the Iranian left to, a set, to, to, a, to the stage where every time you want to address anyone um, regarding the politics of the current struggles, they keep saying, oh, but you have to clarify whether you are for violence or against it, which is... And of course, as I tried to point out in other in articles in Weekly Worker, of course, then we do have uh, the violence of the state, which is unprecedented uh, in terms of its attitude towards mass protests in the region. Even you know, even if you compare it to some of the more brutal countries around us, uh, it has. If you accumulate the record of the Islamic Republic in terms of violence you really couldn't get worse. Um, and if you leave that argument uh, aside, which is not an argument within the left, I think within the left there are a number of issues being uh, raised. And most importantly, um, the question of uh, democracy and socialism, most prominently, of course. And this is a long debate. I was looking at the reading lists uh, for See you, and of course we were reading April thesis in 1979, in 1980, in 1981, because that was so important to our arguments in terms of um, the demands of the the demands for democracy, the demands for socialism, but also the economic demands of the working class, and the way the Iranian left argued about some of these seems to have been missed by the new generation that is now repeating some of the arguments in a way that I didn't expect. For example, there are all the standard debates about a democratic uh, revolution led by the bourgeoisie and how we don't want it. I mean, most people have moved on from that. But there are still, it, it remains an issue of, uh, of great importance in that anyone who talks about the democratic demands being put forward in the Iranian, uh, in the current state, in the current battles of the Iranian left, has to first of all make sure everyone understands they are not talking of alliances with the bourgeoisie or the peasantry. And I thought we had gone past that debate, but clearly we haven't, because you have to make that as a precondition before you move on to the next stage. Um, there are a number of uh, uh, debates taking place about um, the way uh, one deals with the current struggles of the working class. And here, the levels of unemployment have reached a stage which is uh, detrimental, which is dangerous for any future organization. But as we speak, there are still um, enough forces within um, various sections of both the industrial and the, if you like, service industry working class that are involved in setting up committees in factories that have been closed down, setting up uh, both secret organizations and open organizations. And again, as I've uh, alluded before, there is a major debate about the level of um, work that is necessary in um, <coughs> open organization of the working class and the level of work that is necessary in terms of uh, these secret workers' cell. What is missing and what hasn't happened, and it reflects more, more the economic situation and the, effect of, the long term effect of sanctions so far, is that one does not see any signs of the kind of shore of the Soviets that were being set up in the latter part of 1978 in major industries. Uh, the oil workers are organized, they are in communication, but clearly the state's attempts at dividing um, major sections of the working class through privatization, through division of 
workers in terms of regional authorities and so on. The abolition of the um, national status of the oil industry, its partition, uh, and the fact that the car industry is now totally destroyed as a result of sanctions means that the two larger sections of the industrial working class are class conscious, they are trying to organize, they are defending others, they are supporting other issues, but they are not in a position, uh, from what I can gather, and again I might be wrong, but they are not in a position to organize nationwide uh, any of the many protests about which they are uh, involved, in, about which they get involved. Um, having said all that, precisely because of this um, bubble that could burst for positive results in Iran, we have to be against the kind of regime change that the US wants or the kind of regime change that Mousavi is hoping for. Any of these would stop um, the processes that I was trying to explain. The process of protests in the street for democratic rights, the process of factory workers and the working class organizing in the factories and in uh, their districts, in the working class districts. And it would allow, um, it <coughs> probably will allow a level of, a, a short period of uh, relative freedom. But I cannot see that given the political and economic situation, that period of, uh, if you like, relative freedom would last long. It would inevitably go back to a form of dictatorship to maintain this, uh, the status quo. Uh, 